Dost thou profess thy nobility? Do you have royal genes? Almost certainly, statisticians say, or at least for the people we're in concern talking about, for the past 18 seasons, viewers of BBC television show Who Do You Think You Are have been watching with interest as guests from all walks of life discover surprising facts about their genetic heritage. Celebrity guests on the program often draw the highest ratings as people are genuinely curious about who was royal or who has royal genes and genetic lines which produced wealthy, famous, and talented people some of which end up being these celebrities on their show. So have you ever wondered if you have some type of genes that are from nobility? On a recent episode of the show, English comedian Josh Whittacombe found out, much to his surprise, that he was related to Edward I, who served as king from 1272 until his death in 1307, and like most others, who view who discovered they were descended from kings and queens, Whittacombe had no idea he was related to such a well known figure from British history. It had gotten lost through his lineage. At one time somebody probably knew that they were related to the Duke of So and so, which was the uncle of so and so, and so they had genetics attached to it, but that got lost long ago. Interestingly, Whittacombe is the only one of several celebrities and entertainers to have royal genes to be linked genetically to ancient kings and queens. For example, soap actor Danny Dyer recently found out he was descended from Edward III. Meanwhile, comedian and actor Alexander Armstrong was told by genealogical researchers that he was a descendant of William the Conqueror. And like Josh Whittacombe, the rower Sir Matthew Pinsett also discovered that he had a descendant relative of Edward I just like Whittacombe had. Let's get a little deeper here. Is all this just an amazing coincidence, or does it say something about the genetics of those who seek fame or wealth, regardless of their line of work? In truth, it is neither an odd coincidence nor an argument for genetic determinism. What it actually reveals is that the further back in time someone of European descent searches, the more likely they are to find a genetic connection to an ancient European king or queen, and before that, of course, kings and queens from times before from the Middle East and Proto-Indo-European lands that we talked about, and so it can go back much easier from that. I'll describe that here coming up later, but at a certain point, these probabilities rise so high that the odds of finding a genetic connection to royalty reach 100%. So these celebrities are not unique at all. They are related to royalty because everyone, or in the Caucasians, or what we call Western Europeans today, and their descendants, and Americans, so on, has royal genes to some extent, whether the relationship is revealed during organized ancestry searches or not. So uh, here's Josh Whittacombe. I don't know if you've seen him before. If you watch any of these quiz show, funny shows and stuff that come out of the UK now, um, he's on them on a few seasons and stuff. Pretty funny guy. But uh, I think they even mentioned that on one of the shows. I watch a lot of that, but I got really hooked on British television type stuff and BBC things whenever I was a kid and we before cable came out if you want to date me in some way and there was only four channels in PBS and they had a lot of it on there but that's also how I found Monty Python and so much other well-known stuff surprising ubiquity of ancient royal genes genealogical experts who are aware of the math know that finding a genetic connection to royalty is nothing remarkable it's not that common, stressed Graham Holton, a postgraduate genealogy tutor from the University of Strathclyde in Glasgow, when speaking to BBC News. Holton himself is a, rel a relative of Edward I, a trait he estimates up to two million living people actually share. 
it vibrates. I watched another video about this where they show, you know, how one person can have some kids and then they marry into kids, uh, families, and then marry into families again and marry into families again. And after you go about four generations, you ended up with like 6,400 relatives. Like if people live for a few hundred years, you could have a hellish family reunion. Attempts to trace bloodlines can sometimes prove these associations, but not always. Genealogical services have access to extensive historical records, but those only go back so far before thoroughness and accuracy come into question. There's also the concept of they don't have the genetics of those kings. They do have genetics of people that they know have come down that line, so we can go off of that. But just like whenever they talked about King Tut's genetics going on, we know he only had a few kids, they're talking about Akhenaten and the trace back from that and people that are related to that in R1B and who all that spans, which you'd be surprised at how much people that and E1B1 and so on has touched around the world. Royal lineages tend to be somewhat easier to establish since records of aristocratic births, aristocratic births, there's that Ari, and deaths are more likely to have been tracked and saved for long periods of time of a king, of course, rather than a commoner. But even here, great uncertainty may exist since the extramarital affairs and other dalliances of the elite and powerful often produce children that were not officially acknowledged, this would be especially true if the secret relationships match royals and aristocrats with those considered to be of lower status. And we know that that quite often happened. And in doing so, there's more of a bleeding out, if you will, or a spreading of these genetics than one would commonly think directly from these lines but some others that get melded in. Whether you can actually prove it, a genetic connection to royalty or not, is one of these issues. Holton confirmed probably lots of people who are, would not be able to prove it with documentary evidence, you know, paperwork and such, but it isn't really necessary to trace a person's genetic heritage back in, indefinitely to draw conclusions about their bloodlines and potential royal genes. So if you go back far enough, does everyone have royal genes? Are we all related somehow? As family trees move back through time from parents to grandparents to great grandparents and beyond, a person will begin to accumulate a tremendously large number of long deceased kin, like I was talking about before. This increases the chances that individuals who today share no social ties actually do share some distant relatives since there aren't any endless number of people who've lived and died in the past there has to be a connective in fact one connective we could say is that all blue-eyed people are known to have existed somewhere around the black sea area they have come out now and said although there are blue-eyed people from before the exact gene that the people express today show that point from six to eight thousand BC or around the end of the last ice age again up in the Caucasus area I guess you'd say and around the Black Sea and all that area but in doing so every blue-eyed person are connected to them and they're known to have been a lot of kings connected to those if you simply look up blue-eyed Egyptians you'll see the earliest dynasties have that trait they have these strange crystal blue eyes that they had in the statues they show of them. And of course their lineages go down and uh, what you would think of as the counts, dukes, and duchesses and stuff. Or the princes that don't become the king of course became scribes and all these important people. When you see their statues they have that and it fades through time too. It's like you can see some red and blonde hair there. And in fact, if you look up hair and curly, it'll show you the fact that they had a black wig on this lady that pulled and apparently pulled her scalp off with it but up under her black wig was actually blonde curly hair and 
or scalp still attached to it. I also realized long ago the natron doesn't actually change color of hair any bit because why would they have black, brown, red, and blonde hair if it didn't do anything when all of these went through the same process? Irregardless, if you look into it, a lot of people have this genetic code. And that's just one pointer, though. But there are other pointers and other genetic markers. You can also find this blue-eyed trait in the early Sumerian statues, people in India, all over the Far East, in fact. And I've done a video about it recently showing this fact, and early Buddhists and things like that. So, and as a swath that goes a far distance and really you don't have to go that far back in time to make the connective if they think it just comes from the end of the last ice age. A demographic research organization based in Washington DC called the Population Reference Bureau estimates that approximately 107 billion anatomically modern humans have lived on earth since 50,000 BC which basically is about the time of Cro-Magnon if you will and it's coming into being and they have also genetics of Cro-Magnon from a little bit later than this at about 29,000 BC and its genetics are still extant today so all this supposed rapid evolution and things like that it never happened that way and I guess that's for a different video really but if you do the math this comes out to 15 deceased individuals for every one person alive today basically Needless to say, there just simply isn't big enough population for everyone to have a separate lineage. Approximately 300 generations of humans have lived and died in the past 6,000 years alone, which reveals the astronomical number of ancestors each person's family tree would have to include if they were to complete a thorough genealogical examination. I.e., you come from this family that you have and it goes back grandma and grandma and everything but then you can take the lineage of your dad and granddad's brothers and sisters great granddad's brothers and sisters and all the things that are attached onto that and imagine how many that is and how it comes down and if all those people were in the football stadium it would have to contain at that time with just a great grandparent and all the ritherings off this, if we were to say, well, no, no, we're talking about going back at least three, 300 generations here. And we're not talking about the whole scope of the situation. So you start to understand the numbers that they're talking about of these people, of course, and we are those people that are talking about. So there must be significant significant genetic overlap between everyone's family trees even if it doesn't show up on modern genealogical searches i.e. they can't just say we, every time you get R1B they don't turn around and go well, you might be related to King Tut even if you get M269 exact variants and so on and they found 16 exact variants that they can go well there's something that's kind of specialized to those genetics and go even deeper and it still covers a huge swath of people. You can imagine with the idea coming out of Egypt of Mariotin, who ended up becoming Scotia, and the idea that comes there, there could be a lineage connected to Egypt easily off of that. But this lineage is also supposed to... So you, should you see something different? Well, no, because this is the same lineage that we're known as to be real common in 60 or 70 percent of the population in Europe. While this may be something we can understand intuitively, mathematics, who have uh, mathematicians who have examined the issue more deeply have research conclusions, or reach conclusions, I'm sorry, that could push us outside of our intuitive comfort zones on this concept. So there's a queen from before. Do you have genes to connect to her or other people? Well, there's a lot of connections, even into those people there. I'll actually show you how Muhammad, through a series of things, 
uh, in generations hooked up to ancient Spanish kings and because of that nature actually hooks up to the royalty that's in England today. But Muhammad was also a known redhead and so on so things are a little different than people probably would gather in a modern day about that and what's being shown but that's probably for other videos mathematics and our shared genetic heritage according to national geographic the groundbreaking study in this area was published in 1998 so back way back then by joseph chang a statistician from yale university professor chang performed a definitive mathematical study which designed to answer a specific and fascinating question how far back would a genealogical study have to go before it would find a common ancestor for all Europeans alive today? Chang constructed a mathematical model to help him answer this question, and after running the numbers, he was surprised to find a common ancestor for all Europeans would have existed as recently as 600 years ago, possibly or just a few decades before Columbus set on his historic altering voyage across the Atlantic. This means that if every one of European ancestry could trace their ancestry back to the year 1400, each family tree would include that one particular individual. Like Kevin Bacon and six degrees of separation and so on that they talk about, this is like, well, it's uh, 600 years of separation, but somewhere along that line they'd be like oh and i connect to that same guy he would be on the end of a branch of a tree that had other people that you don't know about really your great 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 uncle's lineage and things that you could meet one day in a store and stuff and have no idea how closely you're related to him it's amazing And if the tracing were to continue past this point, Chang showed the number of people showing up in everyone's family tree would start increasing. That, would, that process would continue until about the time when the genealogical survey passed from the second millennium AD into the first. At that point, each person's family tree would include 80% of those who were alive in Europe in 999 AD. Think about that give or take a few decades or so, really, if it would also include 80% of those who lived in earlier periods, of course. So this always contains the ones before. Here's Josh in the show, Who Do You Think You Are? That show may not go across in America if it's real inclusive and stuff, so it's probably the reason we don't have something like that. <coughs> Pardon me. The number is limited to 80% because 20% of those living at the time either didn't have children or had children or grandchildren who did not have children, which therefore allowed the family line to die out. But the remaining 80% of that family line would be related to every European who currently resides on Earth. And to all Canadians, Australian, Caucasians, New Zealanders, and North and South Americans who had European ancestors. You can think about that. But also think about, but the remaining 80% would be related to everybody currently resides on Earth. Well, this concept is, well, the family tree dry, died out right here. Well, if you go back to that grandfather, he had other siblings that still carried that on. This is the idea of King Tut that I talked about earlier, where King Tut had two children. They have them there. They miscarried, so on. Blah, blah, blah. Well, that did make the lineage change in Egypt from exactly the lineage it was supposed to keep going on to. But how did that carry on? What are we talking about? Well, father and grandfather and so on had a lot of children. Just like Ramses. He had over 100 children through all these different women and stuff. So you can imagine if we didn't take somebody who had three children and expand it and it turned in three generations into 64 and 128, 6,400 down a tree if you started with 100. Pretty overwhelming. Such a conclusion may be impossible to believe, but the mathematics back it up. 
pedigrees begin to fold in on themselves a few generations back, wrote Adam Rutherford, a British geneticist who expanded on Chang's work and its implications in his award-winning 2017 book, A Brief History of Everyone Who Ever Lived. What this means, he stated, is that you can be, in fact, are descended from the same individual many times over. Yeah, it's odd, if you think about it, if we went back to that 10,000-year blue-eyed guy, all these blue-eyed people were breeding with each other that would have been distant relatives anyhow. So there's that simple portion of concept right there gives it to you. To illustrate the mathematics more fully, in 2015, Rutherford published an article in The Guardian where he explained how every single European living today was descended from the Charlemagne the Great. The legendary founder of the Car Carolingian Empire, Carolingian Empire, pardon me, and who united Western and Central Europe in the 8th century. By definition, this means that all living Europeans carry royal genes, whether they know it or not, from this type of point. Here's Charlemagne here, that sword people involved. We all have royal genes. In a 2002 article published in The Atlantic, journalist Steve Olson explained how the findings of Chang's research would apply not just to modern-day Europeans, but virtually everyone living on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean. Well, the Caucasians there, of course, he's, we're talking about that lineage. Almost everyone in the New World, a.k.a. the Americans, including Bermuda and the Caribbean, must be descended from English royalty, Olson wrote. Even people of predominantly African or Native American ancestry because of the long history of intermarriage in the Americas. Well, what he's actually referring there is because of their admix. Yeah, looking into genetics, they have ancient admix from previously already modern Europeans or modern humans from out of Africa that had come back in and so on. And then there's later forms through the times of Islam that no one talks about and uh, admixing events so too. So if they had connections, they have it through their admix, just like they have a small portion of Neanderthal admix. Though it's known that Sub-Saharans never did, they do now because of admix. Think of it along that line. Factoring in context between people of all religions, Olson explored the ultimate implications of Chang's study. Speculating even beyond what the mathematics had already shown, everyone of all European ancestry must be descended from Muhammad, which I talked about before. He deduced Confucius also, which may not necessarily have the Oriental ancestry that you might think of in your mind. Nefertiti, which of course is from ancient Egypt, and we've talked about her, and we could say a bunch of more Egyptians, of course, and nobility from other places, too, and just about any other ancient historical figure who was even moderately prolific must today be counted among everyone's ancestors. If you start to take this uh, 300 generations and you took it to 3,000 generations ago and put it back in the time and the ancient times of first writings and so on like that, these people that we hear about, their connections all the way through time too, must have eventually blended into the, uh, the other people that we're talking about later and having connections. And so that web goes pretty deep. So if these mathematical studies are indeed correct, what it means that everyone reading this article has royal genes, and likely many times over. What it also means is that having royal blood doesn't make someone special or unique in any way, including the royal genes of Josh Whittacombe. This is, of course, what critics of monarchy as a form of government have been saying for a long, as long as there have been kings and queens anywhere in the world. Well, it was just somebody that we selected that was of the caliber that we could choose to do such a thing. A lot of times it looked like it was some type of destiny because there were people in line that had a connected to it. 
But here's an amazing thought. Everybody in this picture is related to an ancient person 300 years before Charlemagne. Right? So, we were kings. At some point in some connective in a reality. So you hear about that as a joke and so on. And it's probably going to be a joke for many generations to become. But in reality, another flip card of the page in talking about one certain people that heralded civilization. It goes back much more. In fact, the finding that they did herald civilization everywhere, it does have connectives. And if we could go far enough back, it has connectives which are much more far-reaching than talking about in this one article. Let me know what you think downstairs. And like, share, and subscribe if you haven't subbed yet. Ring that bell and make sure it's open. Peace.